a good chance students will be around. So that's a good time to do it. But anyway, and also, you, that's, you know, if you're not getting caught up on homework, this is a good time to do it. So, um, yeah, we want to do an interview, just let you know. And Two things. If you want me to find somebody for you, and if you want me to pair you up with somebody. Yeah. Because I would encourage you to pair up. And it, you can also, you could put down if you have a particular belief, you know, atheist, Muslim, Hindu. We don't I necessarily have I won't necessarily be able to fulfill that, but I could. <laughs> I mean, I, I know some Muslims. Oh, about you or Jesus? The dinner, November 19th. It's a Saturday I'm, night. Saturday night. Already, right? yeah. Okay, but anyway, so let me know. Otherwise, I won't do anything for you. I'm offering to do this. Okay. Anything else? Any other announcements? Yeah. While we're talking about the dinner, uh -huh. I am doing a flower. If anybody else can help me, I would love to have some help. That's fun. It doesn't make any flower. <laughs> Is there a sign up, Jeannie, on the flowers? I think there is. So it'll be a link on the email. There goes to sign up, Jeannie. <coughs> sign up, Jeannie. It's a whole list of things they need. And. Uh, Flowers is one of them, so maybe you could join Lil and Annette. Come over to my house. But, I got yes. If we sign up and do something at Tom's house, can we do the interview while we're there, or set it? Is it set up at yeah. a different time? Not likely. No, it's going to be too noisy, too busy. All right, thank you. you need you need about an hour of quiet, and you're not going to have an hour of quiet okay. at, at there. So you're just going to be able. To, Actually, all you do is get the contact and say, you know, send them an email and say, when can we get together? Yeah. Okay. All right, quick review last, last week. I don't know why I call it. People are weird or at least different. I don't know. That's left over from the last year. But, okay, renunciation. Okay, so the two things that uh, Shane talked about, renunciation and... In, uh, not incarnation, uh, identity. So what did Christ give up? What did he renounce? His place in heaven? Which must be a nice place. Anything else? When you think? The idea is like, you know, what does a missionary have to give up? How about that? What does a, you know, he gave up, Christ gave up his power. But what does a missionary have to give up if you're going to be a goer? What, what do you give up? Comfort. Comfort. <coughs> control. Control. Family sometimes. Yeah, give up your family, time with family. What do I have? I have what you're good at, your way of doing things. You know, so those are two things. How about identification? Oh, I was going to say, okay, this thing about uh, giving up. Uh, this reminded me of uh, a time. I used to uh, travel a lot, and when I traveled a lot, I used to, you know, I used to fly a lot. And when you travel and you fly a lot, what happens is uh, the airlines, hotels, they really like you. And so you you get to fly uh, first class and you stay in five star hotels. So that's really nice. And the, and the interesting thing about when that happens is you get used to it, and you come to expect it. And I had a flight attendant tell me the most difficult passengers are not in coach. They're in first class. Yeah. It's the premier executives who don't get what they think that, what they're, what they're deserved. <coughs> so that's interesting. You know, you think, you know, you think when you have a lot that you're, you know, but it's, you get used to it. So just, you know, I just think when we, th we look at Christ and we talk about, you know, when you think about Christ, what he give up, or maybe Christ in his suffering, we kind of immediately focus on Easter. But he gave up a lot just, you know, he didn't come first class. He came to a manger, you know, not a five-star hotel. So he gave up a lot. Okay. Uh, okay, identification. Uh, this was... You know, we, we, we learn to speak their language, their customs, their food. I think that's what I have up here. Dress, food. 
Would you say respected also? Respect? Respect, language, dress, culture. I'm thinking that you're going to take on their language. You're going to take on their dress, take on their food. You know, that's why when I tell people we're going to China, if they tell me they don't eat Chinese food, I say, well, you're not going to China. You know, I mean, you need to be able to. Try to embrace it. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's not, I don't think that's asking too much. You'd have to eat while you're there. Well, you know, people say, well, just pack a many jars of peanut butter or something. What's that? Just as long as you don't have to eat caterpillars. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> the food is actually really very good. But some people are kind of funny about that. Anyway, so if you're going to be a missionary, you have to be able, you know, I mean, for me, actually, the biggest thing for me, in, if I were going to be a goer, would be having to wear pants all the time. Because most, most places you go, maybe not China, but certainly the Muslim countries, you know, they wear so much clothing, and it's hot. And, you know, the first thing I do when I come home is I go to my shorts and a T-shirt. And I don't take them off until, you know, until Monday. That would be tough. That would be, that would be, you know, and that's just something you have to get used to. Okay. Anything else? All right, so we're going to watch uh, Six Ways to Reach the World. We're going to do on Sunday. Tonight is on Sunday. Sound. themselves as um, enablers, you know, we can't um, get the missionaries out of the field. 
it really was important when somebody cared. Uh, you know, that they could ask us a uh, thing, do they could tell us things, and we really cared, but we respond to it. So they do that thing. I enjoy being a sender because it bonds me with the missionary. These are people that I knew personally before they went. It's like they're part of us. It's like your own children sometimes. Feeling like you're ministering as you can. What God has given you, you can use, and you can <coughs> you feel a part of being a teacher in a foreign country. I think one of my prayers um, for my generation is for people to to grow in Christ, to see themselves as like every blessing that they have, right, is to, is to be used for God's kingdom. I mean, we're only here on earth for a short time. You know, you might as well make most of it. All churches should adopt support groups for the missionaries. What can I do to relieve burden, you know, on those who go? And I think when you start asking that question, um, then you start really starting to consider it. Okay, a few more things about sending. I have to say. Okay, how missionaries are sent is dramatically changing. Uh, it used to be when people wanted to go, they would contact their denomination and sign up, and their denomination would send them. But that's less and less. Uh, mainly, maybe because the denominations are shrinking, they have less money, so you know they're just basically unloading people. You know, they're just they're not in the business anymore. So that means, you know, you need a sending organization. It's not going to be like, you know, the Presbyterian Church or the Methodist Church, but you got sending agencies like Wycliffe Pioneers Frontiers that do the sending. And the goer is going to have to raise their own support. You just can't show up and say, hey, I'm ready to go, send me. I mean, I think IMB, the Baptist, is maybe the exception. Um, Past missionaries tend to have 30 more churches providing 75% of their support. So it used to be you could count on churches doing the sending, you know, coming up with the money. Missionaries today will have fewer churches, less than 10, and support will be more than 75% from individuals. So like our daughter, I think she might have two, well, two or three churches, mostly individuals. Okay. The amount you need to raise depends on where you're going. You can go to India for 20K, or you need 100,000 if you're going to go to Europe. So it can be a lot of money. And so you try to imagine, say, a family going to Europe, where are they going to get 100K? You know, I mean, what if an individual were to give, say, a church, if a church were to give 2,000, that would be a lot. So that's 50 churches. Well, you're not going to get 50 churches. So you're going to have to go to individuals, you know. So you can see it, it's, it's a huge job for people to go. Typically, say, one to two years to raise support, and that's somebody who's well-connected. And I guess, is that the last thing I have? Oh, I've got one more. You know, there's pluses and minuses to this change. The minus is it's more work for the missionary, you know, to raise the support. But the plus is now you have people who are going who are in a relationship with those who are being sent, who those who are going. And that's a, that's a good thing. I tell Marie, you know, her, her mission field isn't just the Chinese students. It's also her supporters. You know. So it, it's, you know, it's good for the body to interact and share. She can share things that she's experienced, and you can share things. So I, I, all in all, I, I see it as a good thing, but it is a whole lot more work for the goer having to do this. Um, and if you think about it, if you ever thought about going, and maybe most of you haven't, if you thought about going, you thought all the obstacles to going, I mean, there's a lot of obstacles. You know, it's like, you know, you're, you're giving up the American dream. I mean, come on. It's, it's a huge obstacle. You say, there's no way, there's no way I can do this. And you finally 
surrender to God and say, okay, I'm going to do this. And then you try to go, and you've got to spend two years raising money. That can be very disheartening. And so it's, you know, I just think it's just a tragedy. If somebody's willing to surrender to God and go, and then they can't because they don't have the funds. So perspective says six ways to reach the world. You know, we got learn, pray, go, send, mobilize, all that kind of stuff. Piper says you have, God gives us three choices. Go, send, or disobey. <laughs> Everybody in this class should be a sender if you're not a goer. And actually, most goers are also senders because they understand how important that is. So everybody ought to be a sender. And if you don't know anybody, of course, that's not true. You do know somebody. Because Alyssa and <laughs> Traher, <laughs> did I do it Traher. right? Yeah. Traher. Traher. They're goers. They're, they're, looking, they're raising support. And you have some flyers or something? Mm -hmm. Okay. So bring those down here so people can pick those up at the break. So they're, they're raising support so they can go. Uh, Shane Bennett is trying to build his ministry in Sicily to reach the Muslim refugees. I'll put, a, I'll put both links in the email, but you can you have to hand them right here. So, you know, and if you want somebody, I know lots of people who are, lots of needs out there because I'm on a mission board. Now, but everybody in the room should be a center. Because your only other two choices are to go or disobey. David, yeah. the church was not single mission? Why aren't they? <clears throat> yeah, why aren't churches sending missionaries? Anyone want to have an answer to that one? Well, they might be sending 12 to 15, but they can't pay all of the money. So they are sending, they're just, they're just, they're just booked. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. There is, some, there is some sending, but a lot of it is just goes to Local ministry. Have you ever, haven't you ever heard somebody say we have enough of our own problems in our church? A lot of uh, times. Huh? I was going to say, a lot of churches that I have been aware of are more about maintaining their own buildings than they are about actually pursuing the mission of Christ. There you go. And uh, people are concerned more with seeding than sending. Seeding. Seeding. You mean planting seeds? No, she means where you sit. Oh, sitting, sitting. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the pews. Comfort of the pews, exactly. Uh, who's the author of Hole in the Gospel? Uh, the, the president of World Vision? Anyway, he wrote a book, Hole in the Gospel, and he says, you know, I, the statistic I pull out of there is the average believer gives 2%, not 10, 2 whatever. And the average church only gives 2% outside its walls. So you're talking about 2% of 2%. That's why that's why the churches aren't giving. Because they spend it 98%. They spend it on the congregation inside the walls. Yep. So anyways, yeah. So the, and, you know, that's, that's, that's what the churches are doing. But that's why individuals need to give. And I don't know that, that, that as I say, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I don't think the church knows all about like perspectives at all. They don't have to see the whole picture. They only see part of the picture. They're not looking at the full picture of what it takes for someone to do. They're only looking at one thing. Yeah, yeah. they're looking at their congregation. Yeah. yeah, you have to have a heart for the world before you're going to give to the world. Okay. Anything else on the <coughs> Okay, so we're all going to be centers. All right, let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, just Again, thank you for this evening. Thank you for this lesson. Um, you've all given us uh, resources, uh, and, we, and we, you know, you've given us opportunities. So we pray that you put us in contact, our resources in contact with those opportunities, to make your word known where it is not. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so tonight's lesson is such so special. This is lesson 12, and this is my first, I don't know what to call it, homegrown or whatever perspectives teacher. You know, normally when you start coordinating, you, all you do is you kind of inherit all the instructors from whoever had it before you, which is what I did. Except in 2009, 
I went to Urbana. And uh, I went as an uh, exhibitor for InterServe, so I'm working the booth. But at Urbana, you have a morning session and an evening session. You know, the plenary sessions where we're, you know, just massive worship service. But they're in, in the middle, they have all these seminars that you can go to. And I never went. You know, I either went to the exhibit, had to go work at the exhibit, or I worked out. That's what I do. And I knew my wife, who wasn't there, was going to be really mad at me for not having some material to share with her about well, what happens. And that's, i got to go to a seminar. So my wife is a medical doctor, so I'm going to go to a medical... I, you know, they, they have you know, all these hundreds of seminars. I find some, the medical ones, looking for a medical one. Oh, there's a medical one. I go to that one. So I go to this one, and it's in this big ballroom that holds a 1,000 people. So you guys are really lucky. <laughs> Held and, like 200. <laughs> uh, it was a thousand people. <laughs> and and I, I'm, I sit up front. So I, I got there early. I'm sitting in front, you know, what is this? And, and Rick comes out there, and he begins by asking everybody, uh, so why are you here? Or what is your major? You know, because he says, how many people are pre-med? How many are pre dentists How many nurse and physical therapists or whatever? And is there anybody here who hasn't put a hand up yet? My hands up. I'm a nuclear scientist. <laughs> you, sir, what people are you in? I said, well, I'm a nuclear engineer. I said, I think you're in the wrong class. <laughs> How wrong was he? Because if I hadn't gone to that class, he would not be here. Marie wouldn't be in China. He would have taught my perspective class. Marie would not have gone to Memphis, would not be in China. He just totally disrupted it, everything in my life. <laughs> and it's because what he said had nothing to do it was had it transcended anything healthy. You know, he was living a life that I had never even heard of before. And he, I'm sure he'll tell you about that. But he he said three things. He said that you have to get out of this thing, and that is number one: surround yourself with like-minded Christians. And this is so true. Okay, you guys come through this class. You are not the same person you were less than zero. You are different. And you, the last thing you want to do is go hang around with a bunch of people that are going to take you back to where you were. You've got a heart for the world. You want to hang around with people who have a heart for the world and challenge each other, challenge your church to push, to push forward. So you want to hang around with like-minded. And, and I don't know, you'll share about that. He hung around with three other people just like him, got him into trouble. <laughs> okay, so you, don't want to hang, you want to hang around with like-minded Christians. The second thing is don't compromise. Which is, which is almost impossible, because that's what we do as believers. Is we say, okay, good Lord, I'll do this, I'll do that, but I can't do this. Not yet. You know, so we're always doing that. We're always compromising. You know, this is what I'm willing to do. I'm not willing to do this. And then next year, it's something else. You know? And you get God just keeps working on us, chipping away until you surrender. And maybe that's where you're a goer. You know? So don't compromise. And the third thing he said was, don't wait. And of course, this is kind of like this is kind of like compromise. You know, you say, okay, well, not yet. Maybe next year. You know, students finish my education. Working people wait till retirement. You know, you always come up with a reason why. Mm, not just, not just yet. You know. So he said, don't wait. So those are the three things. Anything else you have to share? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So here's Rick from that. <laughs> just move this over to. <laughs> well, uh, listen, thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction and for the invitation. And um, I'm a Perspectives um, alumna. Alumna? Alumnus. Alumnus. Um, took it twice, I think, uh, when I was younger as a, a medical student. I think I audited, so I didn't have to feel guilty about not reading the textbook. And then one time I was a little bit more serious about it. But uh, I'm not a prospective speaker usually. I've done this lesson for David and maybe a couple others over the years. Um, but I'm, I'm happy about this. It's a good lesson for me. Let me first uh, soften you up with a personal connection. This is my freakishly large family. Um, I, I figured out halfway through my marriage that my wife had a Chinese boyfriend, which was a little yeah. disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
Those viewers that are homeschooled, maybe that's a joke. That, um, <laughs> yeah, adopted Chinese girls. Yeah. Twenty-two to. Um, this is how much I uh, can't get away from the bulldog's jaws. Today is the six-year-old's birthday, November third. Uh, here I am in Wilmington with you. So, all right. Here's here's the assignment for me and for you. Uh, Lesson 12, Christian Community Development. It's a review of world need. We're going to look at that in some detail. The role of social action and the balance it must maintain with the work of evangelism. To me, that's the biggest point, and I may not have to persuade you of this, but there has historically been, at least in, since the middle of the 20th century, a tension between people who say, preach the word, proclaim the gospel, call people to repentance and forgiveness, and saving their souls is what matters. Everybody's going to get sick and die, and saving their souls is what matters. And others who say, no, the kingdom of Jesus is about justice and righteousness, and it's, it's half a gospel, it's a whole in the gospel, if you don't care meaningfully about people and love them and serve them and meet their needs. And that Christian people, of all people, ought to be the vanguard of the revolution, of bringing the kingdom and values of Jesus to the world. So, we're going to talk about that um, tension, and going to use our work in Memphis as sort of just a way to describe it. Nothing that I'm going to say about what we do is prescriptive. I don't think that everyone should um, do as my family did and move into an inner city community necessarily or pick the countries that we're going to talk about. It's just an example. I'm your Lesson 12 example. Um, if you don't like what I say, I will give back half of my speaking fee tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, build community development into outreach as a sign of Christ's lordship. Hugely believe in the reality of that statement and that, that, and that practice. And lastly, examine the charge that missionaries destroy culture instead of serving culture. So that's where we're going. We got two hours or so to do it. This is me when I was 26-ish years old. I grew up in New Orleans. Um, those three other people with me on the right were my medical school classmates. Medical school's four years. In the very first year, when you're carving up a uh, gross anatomy of a uh, human body to learn anatomy. Around that time, we had a Christian medical society group, a group of, of evangelicals. Uh, New Orleans is a very Catholic town, so our, our Protestant group was kind of small. I swung four votes uh, the second year to get elected president. <laughs> but that first year, while we knew almost nothing, really almost nothing, um, my own experiences were a late high school conversion, dramatic conversion from cultural Catholicism to, to being a Protestant, and then I was formed by what we used to call Campus Crusade for Christ in many ways, or crew, as, as people talk about now, but 22, so I wasn't 26, I was 22, right out of college, and a, a moron, but the <laughs> four of us, some things never change, um, we made a blood pact that when we finished medical school and the training that follows medical school, we would work together as Jesus doctors whatever that meant. We didn't know anything more than that. And it was a blood pact. The blood part being, if anyone backed out, we would take, take them out. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so, many years later, uh, the pact was 86, 87. Um, I, I happened to go to Urbana th that year, 1987. Um, this is 1995, so you've got to go to med school for four years, and then depending on your specialty, you got to go for another three years or four years. So this is the day, finally, because it's hard to care for the poor in healthcare. It's very expensive to provide healthcare to the poor. So it took us a lot longer than we hoped. But 1995, nine years after the dream, or the, the blood pact, this truck showed up with the sign, and we put it on the building. And this was a little clinic building that was, was uh, in a shopping center in southwest Memphis between the Department of Human Services, which is like the place where you get welfare services, and on the other side, honest, is a, a, a roller skating rink that serves alcoholic beverages to skaters. So, health care issues right there. <laughs> People with orthopedic issues and stuff like that. So, um, the four young Louisianans living in now in Memphis, Tennessee, and some nurses and others that we, we dragged along the way. So, you, I, I showed this one too soon, but this is what it grew to, a single health center in 1995, and I'm going to show you more. Um, this is a map of Memphis, and so, remind me your name again? Carla. Carla used to live in Bartlett, right? Yeah. 
So um, the Mississippi River is the gray structure on the left, and yeah, if you can see the dots, the dots each represent 25 people. So I, I'll tell you, the places where you see blue are the places where educational attainment is the lowest, where crime rates are the highest, where health disparities, the differences in health outcomes are the biggest. For instance, a white woman um, who gets breast cancer in Memphis, Tennessee, is only half as likely to die as an African-American woman with breast cancer in Memphis, Tennessee. A black woman is twice as likely to die of breast cancer. Um, a white guy born in 1964 is going to live eight years longer than a black guy born in Memphis in 1964. The health disparities are astounding in these places. I've already given away the secret of the dots. Blue is black people, 25 black people for every dot, 25 white people for every red dot. The yellow dots are Latino people. Um, I joke that there are only like six Asians in all of Memphis, two in my house, so they don't have a dot. <laughs> This is the way I'm going to show you Charlotte. Is a, uh, the guy who does these maps, his name is Eric Fisher. He's done most major cities, and Wilmington will get there someday, but there's not a Wilmington map for me to show you. But there's one of a city 200 miles away from you, Charlotte, that I'll show you in a second. Um, the breakdown of health disparities and educational disparities in the United States of America, especially in the cities of the South in which we are, is, is along racial lines. We could talk forever about why that is, it is. There's no question about it. There are enough doctors in Memphis for all of Memphis, but they congregate densely here. Such that, our little silly saying is, here in the red land, doctors are competing with doctors to get patients, and in blue land, patients compete with patients hoping to find doctors. Okay, so it's kind of like perspective. Okay. It really, really is. I'm going to show you in a minute, or a few minutes. You mean like the great imbalance? Yes. The, the reality that why is it that we have hordes of money in these churches, but we no longer have denominational sending agencies as we just discussed. Like We have never had as many resources at, at the hands of Christian people in the West as we do now, but we do less than we used to do. So, in... I'm, I'm here, not there, so I can say this out loud. Hundreds of the doctors that I'm talking about are Christian people. They would identify themselves as disciples of Jesus. But they're parked here, and where you see the little crosses is the places since 1995 till 2014, two years ago, where we successively opened more health centers. Such that finally... Um, we were doing about 175,000 patient visits a year, which is pretty sizable. Frankly, it's the large. It was the largest. It is the largest primary care group uh, for poor people or not poor people in the city. Okay. Four yahoos from Louisiana. Been to Louisiana? Mm -hmm. Okay. Usually, you can spot Louisiana people have this kind of squint that you don't see, except like in carnival workers and other people like that. Right? Okay. So. <coughs> Nothing special about Louisiana people. Uh, Is there anything special about Memphis? It's poor and like it's not a destination city. All right, so what's the what's the grittiest city in North Carolina that you can look down your nose at? Is it Raleigh? Cleveland. Cleveland. This <laughs> <laughs> is across the river. Yeah. It's so gritty, I haven't heard it. All right, so if we're in South Carolina, people will spit and say Columbia, man, that's a dirty, hot, that's play. You know what I'm saying? Like in uh, Nashville, it's like hotty toddy country music, and Memphis is this flat, hot, poor, violent hole that I love. Okay. What's the population? Million two in that whole wider area. Yeah. Okay, so look, here's the Mississippi border. That's called white flight, right? We're actually in Arkansas across the river. They do the same thing. You do the same thing. We do the same. Here's Charlotte. And Charlotte is, is, is Charlotte the grittiest city in North Carolina? It's the one that's been on TV lately, yeah. most lately. I don't know. But... Okay. All right, so again, like I don't, I don't want to, 
put too sharp a message here, but the schools in the blue areas are horrible. And part of the reason they're horrible, honest, like it's hard to say this, but because when the nation decided that we were no longer going to have separate schools, like the white people pulled out of the schools and went to the burbs, or they suddenly discovered the need to create Christian schools. So we got a horde of Christian schools that came out in the middle and late 1970s in Memphis. And the core of our city was abandoned educationally. And the core of our city was abandoned medically. And again, like it's so hard for me to say it, but the Christians were part of that. Okay, so I'm starting to sound like Breland, aren't I? <laughs> I'm angry. I used to be an angry young man. Now we're angry old men. <laughs> okay. All right. So let me tell you some of the distinctive things that happened to us. I don't have much time to tell you how, but about uh, the year 2002 or so, so that's 14 years ago, 15 years ago, we began to move our families into the communities, which um, I know you get this. Um, my wife, who is awesome, uh, she went to a high school called Hutchison School for Girls. It used to be called Miss Hutchison School for Girls. So you kind of get the flavor of that. Um, so when her family learned that we were weighing the possibility of moving ourselves and our five children at the time into to a low-income African-American neighborhood, like that wigged people out. If you went to your churches, I imagine, and you said, we're, me and my family are going to go to Nigeria to be missionaries, or North Africa are going to be missionaries, People go, well, well, I'm not going with you, but that's cool. I like that. I'll pray for you. I'll give you money. Maybe. Maybe not. Um, <laughs> but if, if you're going to move into a low-income, scary neighborhood in the South, you, you don't get money. You get a psychiatric evaluation, right? Okay. So it was scary when we did it. Um, Bing Hampton is the neighborhood that I've lived in. My family's been in for 12 or 14 years. It's the neighborhood that Marie lived in when she was in Memphis with us for, for a time. Again, the, the river on the left and the city, and it was long ago. Um, you guys see something? No, we're looking where my family is. <laughs> yeah, where, where are they? Where are I'm, sorry, where I'm, I'm sorry, where the inn in Binghamton is? No. Hey, no, no, the second inn, the inn at the end. Hey, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, the end at the very end. <laughs> okay, and just just so south of that yeah. is White Station Road. Yeah, yeah, that's where my family lives. Okay, yeah, like closer to Quince or south of Poplar. Or, yeah. Or, yeah, yeah. All right, summer that's White Station. That's, 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 that's what I was trying to think. Yeah, yeah. back road. Like summer White Station. Sorry. Yeah, summer and White Station. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, summer is the northern boundary of Binghamton, so yeah, I don't know if it's this one or this one, but that's about where your family <laughs> was. So this is East Memphis, which is a great neighborhood. It's the neighborhood that my wife and I lived in before we moved here. Um, this is the house that I found for my wife. Um, on the block, in fact, next door, a couple of doctors who we recruited from Chicago to work among the poor in Memphis in the clinics that we were operating at that time. Two, I think we had two at that time. Um, they were engaged when they moved to the city, and the husband did in Memphis what he had done in Chicago. He just found a house near the clinic where we were, as he had done near the hospital when he was a resident. And um, it was it was in this neighborhood that is, was at that time especially sketchy, uh, scary, whatever the word you want to use. Okay, so I, I um, admired them for doing that, and I expected them to burn out and to, to, to leave soon. But that's not what happened. I would watch them, and it would seem to actually connect with the patients better and enjoy things better. And I saw for the first time what I've seen many times now for, for 15 years is this paradox, like the deeper people get into culture and identify and understand language and food and things and respect them, the, the more they love, they come to love people, and the more they stick around. So I saw that happen, and his name is Joe Weaver, and his wife was Seema. The six-year-old that I just showed you, her middle name is Seema, after the wife and his, the two doctors and his family. They did not get killed the first night or the second night or the third night. And so I started to stalk them. I would drive home through the neighborhood. Dude, hey, Joe. 
Anybody getting killed out here? <laughs> okay. And nobody's getting killed. So then I got to a point where I did the most courageous thing I've ever done in my life. I went to my wife from Miss Hutchison School for Girls, and I said, hey, Laurie, what would you think about How would it go if, with your family and all if we, uh, <coughs> finally I blurted it out, what, what, what if we moved to Big Hampton? And she said, what if we got a divorce lawyer right now? <laughs> <coughs> Not exactly, but it was, it was a conflict, right? And so, um, the two of you are married, I imagine, mm -hmm. yeah, so... They wouldn't be, their agency wouldn't allow them to go if there was a lagging spouse. They both better be in. If they're going to go to a Muslim culture in North Africa and try to live and learn, it better not be her idea and he's kind of cool with it, right? Okay, so I had a lagging spouse. I was fearful, but she was lagging. So even though I am from Louisiana, I wasn't that stupid, and I didn't push it. But I kept sort of bringing it up, and she kept saying, shut up. Okay. And then we went to this thing that Christian people do, which is we, we're going to pray about it for six months. Okay. <laughs> and I was supposed to not do anything, and she was and just basically leave her alone is what was supposed to happen. But on the weekend, she'd get in my car. They'd be like a real estate agent's car. Just like, what is that? <laughs> like I had a girlfriend or something. <laughs> Way before the six months came, because she did pray about it, she came to me and she said, all right, I'm, I'm willing to talk about this. So I kissed her on the mouth, and I put her in the car, and I took her to this. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we had to hack back some of the bushes to get on the porch, which was rotted, and it, this house was built in 1997. It had the old weights. Have you ever seen the weights on a window when you yeah. open it up? So I'd been in it, of course I've been scoping it out, but I, I got the window open, I got her in the front room, I haven't told you, I hadn't told her either, there was an unmedicated schizophrenic guy named Martin who lived in the house. <laughs> so I just said, Martin, you in here Martin? At which time my pious, lovely wife said, who the hell is Martin? <laughs> the house and in a year after we sold the house in the suburbs and um, we moved into this and it's 2002 2003 I guess um, this is the porch on Wednesday nights didn't happen this Wednesday night because we were watching baseball yeah man that was awesome I I've been in a coma all day because that's the way till one o'clock just um, okay, so the reason I'm showing you this is because after a few of us moved in, then we started suckering medical students and dental students and other people to consider coming, being in the neighborhood, help us coach the sports teams, help us do girls club, and before you know it, they started to move in, the students. And that was the don't wait thing that David heard. I was just saying to the students, like, you don't have to think that, oh, after I graduate or after I do this, then I can get involved in ministry or I can do something like that. You can do it even though you don't think you have any time or money or energy, and you should for your own good. So that was that was the don't wait part. So it happens. This guy's just back. This picture's uh, five, six years old. This guy's just back from uh, scouting out Arabic training in in uh, Jordan because they're going to go to an Arab-speaking country. This guy lives in Chad. He's already learned French and Chadian and Arabic, and um, they're in their first term with the IMB as a dentist. Uh, guy back here is partnered with this guy. We have ministry partners. This guy who's turned away is uh, on his, in his first term working among Somalis. Speaks uh, nearly fluent Somali now. Um, so the, um, the deal isn't just, that's, that's part of what I want to say to you, like the deal isn't just America or the world. Like this is two sides of the same coin. Th this is the glory of God and the kingdom of Jesus' values to the lost, whether they're here, if the church is here, the church ought to be advancing those things here, and launching from here to there. 
in the again another paradox we've learned the more we were willing to send our people to the to the ends to the difficult places the more it came to Memphis people said the first time we sent a, a missionary doctor to Afghanistan in 2003 the people on our board of directors said this is not your mission we're here to do health care Christian health care for the poor in Memphis and I said yes but if we do this we'll get more doctors so if that guy left for a five-year term 2003 we had seven doctors when he came back five years later we had 22 doctors okay so part of what we do is we host students and residents that was part of what we again said to the students at Urbana come stay in this old five-bedroom house in my neighborhood being Hampton this is an orange mound so we remember the name orange mound maybe we built that one for the purposes of hosting students and some of you are clever enough you can pick out my kid in that picture can you? <laughs> yeah. all right so his nickname is DJ Jimmy D and he is a goof he's 17 now this is a picture when he was probably eight but um, I sometimes I don't put this in there because I don't have enough time because this is this is like even weirder like there's the 11th commandment for people like me people like Breland thou shalt get the best education for thy child or thou stinketh really badly <laughs> right didn't you your parents follow that rule he did it all on his own he was saying earlier we understand that <laughs> um, this school Brewster William Herbert Brewster Elementary School uh, only 29 30 percent of the kids are proficient in reading so flunk the 11th commandment on that okay. that kid's cross-cultural okay. that kid got in some scrapes and scuffles in his time but so did I in my white upper-class schools that I went to when I was younger He's 17, he's lived in a dysfunctional community maybe, but he's done it with his parents and a whole group of other people who are bound together through faithfulness to Jesus and the gospel and to missions. He knows scores of people, that's an exaggeration, dozens of people who are living in Afghanistan, North India, going to Morocco, Algeria. Like, he's profited in big ways, and so have his, his siblings. This is what we do about church and again the, you'll have a talk about multiplying churches and um, this was weird in America to do house churches this is my living room this picture is probably six or seven years old there are 16 house churches now as we began multiplying in different neighborhoods and and um, so this is this is larger than an average house church for us now but here are the things that I've learned about house church and again this isn't prescriptive but these are the things I learned about house church. You can shepherd 10 people. I don't think you can shepherd 1,000 people. Okay, so I'm a, I've been a house church leader for years, and I, without pay, have learned to love and care for the sheep that are in my house, about half of which are my children, so I was already had to jump on that. But um, I, I can know and pray for, specifically, just the people that are in my Church. Even though my church now over the last 14 years has multiplied, it's divided, however you want to say it. Okay, and on the on my mantle, it's not here in this picture, but we have a little tin, and that's where people put money, just like you put money in when you go to church, or maybe you do it electronically or something, but there's a little thing, and people put money in it. But we don't have any paid staff. We don't have any buildings. We don't run an awesome baseball program for the kids. We don't have a worship minister. We don't have cool lights and music. We got nothing, basically. So we can spend almost everything on the poor and on sending missionaries. We are secretly a Southern Baptist church. Our house church's network is aligned with the Tennessee Baptist Association so that we can send missionaries through the IMB, which is the last missionary agency that carries the whole freight for the missionaries so they don't have to raise support, as David was describing. We send more missionaries from this little 300 house church than any other Southern Baptist church in the South. Now, if you're 
smart. You're going, yeah, that's because you select weirdos already. The people <laughs> who live in this. Yes, exactly. You're right. We say to the people, come, see this place, see the injustice, see how bad it is. Maybe even let some of the bad stick to you. Because I used to be concerned about public education in Memphis. Then I put my kids in the school. Now I'm concerned about public education, right? Somebody smart said, where your heart is, there your treasure will be. Like, I really want to see that school system improve. We've got a bunch of young educators who come in and align themselves together and are going to these low-income schools and being Christian teachers. This is uh, another one of the house churches. I, I told you that we don't have any buildings, so we baptize people in the back of a pickup truck. We put a pool liner in it and fill it up with water. So you can only get saved between like April and November. <laughs> <laughs> this is my wife here. We, um, we started uh, six or seven years ago to train family doctors. Uh, so G-L-O-R-I-A, Gloria, is a family doctor, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, because we had all these students coming, because we, we felt like we kind of lost people, uh, medicine is the American dream on steroids, I think it is. It's just lots of money and, and prestige and other things that are poisonous to your soul. So we began to formally train to get approval from um, the governing bodies that accredit medical education to train residents, and this was our first class. To the need, to the nations, or the king, is a summary, basically, of Lesson 12. And it was, it was the slogan, and it remains the slogan for our residency, to the need, to the nations, or the king. So, um, this guy's one of the guys learning Arabic. This guy now lives in Chad. She works at a really great Christian. Natalie King's probably my favorite graduate we've had in, um, in the Appalachians in, in the very easternmost part of Tennessee uh, among very poor rural people. And this guy is heading up the residency training program of which he was one of the first graduates in Memphis. Okay, so um, just briefly, only because you might notice that some of the logos and colors change. Two years ago, so in between the last time I was here and now, um, the board of directors of the organization that we founded in 1994 or 5, and the founding doctors, myself and the people you saw, had a divorce. Um, there were people who were unhappy with our strong suggestion that folks should live in the neighborhoods. There were people unhappy with us sending people overseas. There were people unhappy with us spending resources to train doctors. And there were, probably most importantly, there were people unhappy with us being unwilling to come under the, within the orbit of one of the big hospital systems. So it's all sort of industry nonsense, but hospitals have been buying up doctors' practices a lot. I'm sure it's happened in this market too. And so anyway, we had a divorce. So we've been rebuilding. This is the new version, um, 2.0, Resurrection Health. And this is about a half of the people who work there now. And um, it's the same thing. So these are some of our resident doctors in clinic. Um, this is, actually I didn't notice this, but this is a, what do you call it, a composite of the, of the doctors. Lots of health care to pregnant women and babies. So, again, not everybody's medical, but both of those women are pregnant on the left. And um, so one of our nurses, Kariana, there. And this is a woman who had a difficult pregnancy and delivered twins. And Joyce Liu, or her name is Hoffman now, she married a year ago. It's a pediatrician. So it's health care for tens of thousands of people, the same, same thing I was describing to you earlier. Um, we also have a couple of surgeons who can do surgical things for the poor. Not getting too deep again, but um, one of the reasons, not the only reason, that women die of breast cancer, low-income women die of breast cancer, is they don't get either mammograms or biopsies quickly. 
Um, one of the reasons that the colon cancer death among the poor, the death rate is much higher, is because it's expensive if you don't have insurance to get a colonoscopy, to get one of the screenings. So surgeons do those sorts of things. They also do the less sexy things, the woman with a gallbladder that flares over and over and over again, but because they don't have to do emergency surgery for the uninsured woman, she just repeatedly goes to an ER and gets pain meds and sent on her way. With a with an undocumented Latino guy with a big hernia who can't work anymore until he gets it fixed. Those sorts of things for the surgeons. And lots of work with people who um, live with HIV and AIDS. This is really uh, a great part of medicine now. When, when we were learning to be doctors, it was a universally fatal disease, and now it's, it's completely controllable with these amazing medicines. And, but again, the marginalized people without insurance are the ones who are still dying. Okay, and yeah, so just this is the rebranding again to the to the nations for the king, LA Christian Health Center, Clarkston, Georgia, new clinic for the um, refugees starting next year. This is one of the leaders. Um, this guy's paying off his debt, he'll end up somewhere. Dagestan, presently in a very low income community in North Augusta, Georgia, not terribly far from here, on his way to work with Somalis, leading up a new Christian health center for the poor in Kansas City. So that's where they're from, or that's, that's where they're where going? That's where they've gone. This is the second graduating class. <clears throat> Every one of them loves to share the gospel. Okay, so I, I, again, I don't want you to mistake, like, this isn't just do-goodism, okay? This is, it's, it's love and do-goodism for the glory of God and for the kingdom of Jesus. It's both proclaiming the truth and calling people to repentance and meaningfully trying to meet their needs in a, in a world that's unjust, where they're getting, they're getting stiffed in ways most of us don't even understand. So in the brave new world, the last two years, we've opened three more health centers. So we continue, even through this divorce, like we're continuing to try to strengthen the safety net for the needy in the, in the part of the county, part of our city that needs health care the most. Okay, so I, I thought if I pause here, if anybody wanted to ask questions or push back on anything I said before I moved into the next section, knowing could, that we're going to take a break about 8 o'clock. Could the guy who went to Clarkston, could he set up a resurrection health <coughs> and have he tried, have he gone to other cities? Yes. So um, there is a Christ Community Health Services in Augusta, Georgia. There, um, there's a Christ Health Center that we were helpful getting started in Birmingham. There's the Hope Family Care Center in Kansas City that we trained the first doctor for. And we're going to Clarkston, Springdale, Arkansas, and probably Dallas in the next two years. Our graduates will go to other cities, and I hope that they'll do the same thing. They will. And they'll move into communities of need. They'll love their neighbors. They'll call other people to that. They'll prepare missionaries. They'll plant churches. Lord willing. This might seem like a stupid question, but how are they paying? They're not. How are they paying off their college debts? That is not a stupid question. Yeah. So the average medical student now has about two hundred thousand dollars in debt when they come out of training, and they're told, "No, no, no. You can't be a primary care doctor. You can't be a family doctor because on the totem pole of medicine, the family practice doctor, especially who wants to work." Or they're not at the bottom of the pole. They're like under the ground <laughs> in the part that's submerged underground, right? And up here, I actually, I'm also a primary care doctor at the bottom, so I'm not allowed to look up to see who's at the top exactly. But um, you can't do it, people will say, because you'll have debt and you'll never get paid and you'll work too hard and it won't work. But it's not true. I mean, think it through. Again, like we're offering something that is a little bit odd, but... Come, that house I showed you, the, my dream house for my wife, guess what it cost me to buy? And including the lot next to it, the extra lot. 3,000 square foot house, $31,000. Yeah. I, I might have spent a little bit fixing it up. But still, the grand total was less than half 
of the house that I sold to move, okay? So if you're gonna move into these neighborhoods, you're probably not gonna buy the nicest, newest car, right? Yeah. Um, you can get federal and state loan repayment money if you'll commit to working among the poor as a primary care provider. Not even just doctors, dentists, behavioral health workers, different things. So we've had people, Vanderbilt graduates with three hundred or more thousand dollars, Tulane graduates with four hundred thousand dollar couple who will work, get loan repayment, and be on the field debt free in less than five years. It's possible. It's a good question. So David tells me that um, North Carolina and Tennessee both refused Medicaid expansion. Mm -hmm. So we still have a significantly large number of uninsured patients for which we have a sliding fee scale based on their income, most of whom pay $20. But historically we've, we've met federal requirements to get additional payment for because we are a nonprofit and we take exclusively care of the poor people. So it's a complicated system, but again, it can, it can work. It's not easy. Nobody's, well, it depends on your definition. Like if we're, we're either really, really well paid missionaries or crappily paid doctors, one or the other, right? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of like it. It's another good question. Other questions? Do you go, where do you go to get people? Or I guess, I guess you're going after, you're going after docs, right? I'm going after medical <clears throat> students. I'm going after medical students who still remember that essay that they wrote that I hope wasn't a lie to get into medical school. The ones who still remember the deal they made with God to get through organic chemistry. And then, <laughs> all right? Okay. But there's very powerful socialization in medicine that happens early on. Can I get a witness? Um, yes. You're a, you're a third-year medical student and some impressive doctor with a starch coat and awesome pens, a bow tie, puts his arm around you or her arm around you and says... Hey, Rick, I think you could be a blah, blah, blahologist like me. Mm -hmm. I could. Yeah. It's just, if I didn't have those other three people with the blood pack I told you about, I wouldn't have made it. That's point one. Don't go alone. Get like minded people around you. Marry someone who wants to go to the nations. I, I don't mean you never hang out with other people, but anyway. Um, thoughts. How about the other, the church in the suburbs, the people in the suburbs, what do, what do they think of? Do you, do you cross paths? Or? So I spent the first five years or so trying to pitch to the doctors who were older than me at that time. So we started this, I was probably 30, 31, I'm 52 now. So I thought like, we'll open these health centers for the poor and we'll convince the hundreds of others Christian doctors and dentists that they'll open their doors to the poor and that will help. that's how we'll build this net. This just never happened. Like, in fact, they don't really financially support as much, but they'll send their maid or their whoever they want to give care to us. It's this, I mean, it's the same thing that we're bemoaning 45 minutes ago about why aren't people supporting missionaries more? And like they should. Should Christian doctors give and take care of the poor? Everybody would go, yeah, we should. It just doesn't happen. So I gave up on the old people like me, and I've been pouring myself into medical students. I've been in your neck of the woods in the last month. I went to Duke and UNC and East Carolina and VCU and Richmond and there's a new osteopathic school called Campbell, Campbell. in, in uh, Virginia. And I get the Christian group, sometimes it's five, sometimes it's 50, and I, I just pound them, like, you can do this. You must do this. You are Luke and Leia, and I'm about to die, Obi-Wan. We need you. <laughs> right? Come to the light, right? All right, and then we ask them to come to Memphis to the guest houses, and then they work in the health centers with and doctors and they live in the communities and they see the house churches and they hear about the missionaries and some of them match with us and it could and should happen this is partly like lesson 15 this is what it means to be a sender I'm a sender I spend 
weeks at a time only in the developing world. I'm going to show you some pictures here, but I've lived in Memphis, Tennessee, but I love getting people ready to go and praying for them and sending them out and finding the money for them. And then that's so when you get them, they're, they've graduated from medical school. They're doing their residency. For you. Yes. We have murmured about trying to start a medical school, but I don't think that will happen anytime soon. Yes, we get them as medical students. This this time now between October and January is where the fourth-year medical students are interviewing for the match, the big sorority match that happens for residencies. next. It, the match day is in March where the, the doctor, young graduates, put the list of the places they want to be trained and we all put the people we want and the computer matches us. So we're just hosting, hosting, pushing. But we're not going to get, you know, everybody, 100% of these residents live in the, in the low-income African-American neighborhoods. So, not prescriptive. It could, should happen in education, in legal services. Why can't, why can't it, people, you know, innovatively think about other ways to do it? Other questions, thoughts? All right, we're going to keep rocking. All right, so this is a, a, a fundamentally a course about you understanding <clears throat> a lot, but and this is, I think, frankly, an outdated term. I don't even know—is it used commonly? Mm -hmm. It still is. Okay. It's, most people don't have never heard it until they get in the class. So All right. Still well, relevant. world A, you, whatever. Okay, but the, the question I have for you, which you, you'll guess because I'm here, is like. What's the overlap between poverty and lack of being reached? So if this is the place where two billion people live and the gospel is largely unknown, so this is the most spiritually unreached, how, how, what's the overlap between physical needs and spiritual needs, would you guess? Is it small, medium, or large? Large. It's large. Okay. And it's all connected, oddly, in the messages of Lesson 12. So hopefully I'll be able to make that case. Okay, so this is this is busy, and I'm going to try to help you with it. But what we've done in Memphis is we got two of our really smart guys to sit down and, and find places in the world where they think medicine and healthcare strategies might be a way to get to very difficult to go places. So we call it Priority 15 because there's 15 places. So we see red; those are the areas. It's either a country or a people group. Where the church is non-existent, and we, we do this basically we rate all these places on four levels. So you'll see here this is the United States compared to these other places. Let me show you what I mean by that. Here, here are the four ways we measure it. How unreached is it? So you guys know all about that. That's Joshua Project. And that's just unreached people groups. So the degree of unreachedness or unengagedness. Secondly, the um, the United Nations uses a sort of a collective statistic called the Human Development Index to talk about basically um, how developed is a country socially. So composite statistic measuring the exp life expectancy, educational opportunity, gross national income, so forth. So this is human development persecution index. This is data, data from uh, Open Doors, which gathers data about what are the toughest countries for Christian people to live or minister in. And lastly, physical exertion. How hard is it to live in, sustain yourself and your family in these places? Does that make sense? Okay, so um, only <coughs> a very low score for unreached for the United States of America. We would agree with that, right? But for St. Andrew Covenant Presbyterian Church, so it's, it's higher there. It's what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> it's kidding. Human Development Index, we, are, we got a serious B plus, right? There's honestly, I think we're number four in the world. Norway is the most prosperous for human. Zero persecution, truthfully, per, like no imprisonment for your faith yet, at least. You know, <laughs> wait, wait, till, wait till Emperor Trump gets in, it might change. I don't know. <laughs> and physical, we are the zero, okay? We got Netflix, we got Chick fil A. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, so, yeah, here we go. Joshua Project, I already told you this. Human Development Index, Persecution Index, Physical Exertion. Okay. Um, 
this would be an example of our Chad team. So we've been wrestling with the IMB about solar power for them to sustain them, just to keep a fan going and a refrigerator for food. They've got to get, they've got to get their own power. That would, that's an example. <clears throat> okay, so again, if we if we go a little closer up, um, whereas the United States again was 19, you see places places or peoples like the Turok or the people who, the Nuba Mountain people, where the unreached is much, much higher. And almost always, the human development score is low. So that's an F, right? And persecution ranges, some of these places, at super high levels. So the worst of all would be the places completely unreached, where the human development is very low, and where persecution is very high, and where you can't, you can't live because it's so stinking. You guys telling people where you're going? Yeah, pretty much. Can, can we hear it? Morocco. Morocco. Okay. Well, we're gonna we'll be in Spain, but we'll be in Spain. Yeah. So you're gonna work with uh, North Africa to come up. Too. Yeah. Great. Okay. So highly unreached uh, refugees have lots of human needs. I I I don't know enough about now how much persecution you might face doing that and that sort of thing. Okay. So. We've got and have had for years people working among Somalis. Super unreached, uh, development's very low, persecution and physical difficulties are quite high. Um, this is Joe Weaver and Seema Weaver that I told you about earlier. North India, Afghanistan, North India, Somali, Ethiopia, Somali, Ethiopia, Afghanistan, Afghanistan. Have you lost anybody? Chad, 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 Ethiopia. Lost as in died? No. I think we will. Just like I think I mean, we've got we've got hundreds, a few hundred people living in in sort of dangerous neighborhoods, and so far the worst we've had is like a mugging. But I think at some point something will happen. I know I'm beating this a little hard, but everybody you just saw here and here, but for this guy, lived in the neighborhoods. Okay, so they had a place before they got to here. Now again, you can get to here without going where I'm about to describe, but they thought it through and said, I'm a little scared about living in that kind of neighborhood. My mom's going to be really scared about me living in that neighborhood. The resources there are kind of limited. There's gunshots I hear. It's a different culture. I don't really get it and they don't get me even though I think I do. Like, those are the, exactly what you're going to need to do what you're going to do somewhere else. Because it's two sides of the same coin. Would you say that most people that come already are thinking about leaving for another culture? I would say that <clears throat> most of them have um, about what I described myself having when I was a medical student. Like, I want to be a Jesus doctor somehow. I'm interested in missions. I've been on, you know, almost everybody's been on the Caribbean or the Latin American trip. Um, but without the depth of understanding that you're gaining through perspectives, for instance, and without real experience in pioneer missions, unreached missions, like, haven't made it past the, oh, that's so cool and neat, and I'm going to put it on Facebook stage, to the, it's 120 degrees and my kid's sick and I want to go home. <coughs> so, um, <coughs> Algeria is where he wants to go. So they're going to France first to learn French. This guy we sent off three weeks ago, you asked me if we're still sending people, so, yeah. <coughs> he's, going, he's going with... Uh, <coughs> Frontiers, not not the IMB. Okay, <coughs> it's ten day. We should go through. Keep going. You think? Yeah, you got it. You go to you go to eight or. You... All right, let's let's just go. Through a little bit. Let's let's sort of again. Maybe we don't need to make this argument, but part of the assignment for lesson twelve 
is like dealing with this situation like the social gospel is not the real gospel. Or all you care about is preaching and saving souls and you don't care about anybody's body. What was the charge? You should care as much about live people as you do or living people as un unborn people. The born as much as the unborn. Yeah, the born as much as the unborn. Okay, so maybe you just want to shake that off, but it's it's a legitimate question. Why isn't the Church of Jesus more involved in righting the wrongs of our society, of our culture? Why? Yeah, okay. So, does anybody feel this tension? Can we just skip this whole point? I don't know. The last time I was here, people were like, no, we get it. It's got to be both. <coughs> you sometimes feel the tension. This is a small enough group we can talk to each other. This is a, this is a I don't see that anybody cares about lost souls in church. That's what I think. You can get people to do social work, but you can't get them to show the gospel. All right, does anybody in the room say, man, I think all they want to do is get through the four spiritual laws and they don't care about people's needs? Nobody here has got that one. Okay. So it's just Dave and I here. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, I want to say to the people who love the Bible and who love the proclamation of the gospel that caring for the poor is Genesis to, to Revelation. Okay, just as, hopefully the lights came on for you as they did for me, the Great Commission doesn't just appear at Matthew 28. It, it begins, I think, in Genesis 3 or before, right? So the story of his glory, it's there if you have eyes to see. Well, my goal is to convince you that caring about the poor and being scared of money is totally biblical from beginning to end. So, Let's, let's get through these, and then we'll take a break. I need some readers, because I don't have all this stuff memorized. If you've got a Bible, electronic, or book, somebody start looking up the first few of these, and we've got to keep rolling. Okay. NC State, you got a Bible? Okay. What's your name? Stephanie. Stephanie. You're going to get the Deuteronomy 24? Okay. 19 through 22. Read loud for us, Stephanie. backstory. This is the law. This is the law of Moses. Um, God, with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, has delivered the nation of Israel out of slavery, out of Egypt. They've been baptized through the Red Sea. They've spent 40 years in the wilderness. And then they are brought into the promised land where they are to practice the teachings of the Mosaic law of the Torah. This is that. So, it is God who gives you the land. You are a slave. I brought you in here. You, you know this if you've read the Old Testament. All the tribes got allotted lands. Every clan got allotted lands. And even every family got allotted lands. So the Brelands from the tribe of Judah, of course, right, <laughs> have a plot of land that's part of their way to survive in this, this agricultural theocracy. God is the king. Yes? Okay. So summing up what Stephanie just read, Freeland. When you harvest, don't get every olive, every grape, every whatever. She, she, you said a bad word. She, 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 she. <laughs> Leave the edges of your field, that which is, is remaining when you go through your first time, so that the marginalized, most marginalized people in your culture can come in and eat. Yes? Okay. What unbelievably beautiful book of the Bible demonstrates the gleanings laws? Ruth. Ruth sustains herself and her mother-in-law under the protection of Boaz because Israel kept those gleaning laws for the poor because she was a widow and a foreigner. All right, beautiful. Okay. <clears throat> Leviticus 19, 
this uh, 25, 35, to 38? Yes, sir. Bobby. If any of your fellow Israelites become poor and are unable to support themselves among you, help them as you would a foreigner and a stranger, so they can continue to live among you. Do not take interest or any profit from them, or, uh, but fear your God, so that they may continue to live among you. You must not lend them money at interest or sell them fruit at a profit. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. Yes. All right. Breland's land in the clan of Judah. Um, let's figure out what happened. The bow weevil came and ate his crops that year. All right. So Breland can now go to any one of you and say, I need some help. I need you to help me like you would a marginalized person. I need cash. I need cash. And you can't charge me interest. And what's your job to do, according to this? To give it to him. Why? Because I'm the Lord your God, and I took you out of slavery and gave you the land. Don't do harm to your brother. Help the brother. Help the brother. It doesn't say, um, but don't do it if he drank too much and didn't get his harvest in. That's a, that's a question about the noble and the ignoble poor that we're going to back away from right now. All right. Who's got Deuteronomy 15, 1 and 2? Yes, ma'am. At the end of every seven years, you must cancel debts. This is how it is to be done. Every creditor shall cancel any loan they have made to a fellow Israelite. They shall not require payment from any anyone among their own people, because the Lord's time for canceling debt has been What's the other name for the Lord's time of canceling debts? The year of? Jubilee. 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 Okay, so truthfully, Jubilee is the 7th, seven, 7th. Seven. This is the 7th years. But Freeland, for whatever reason, because he didn't work hard enough or because of the bow weevil or a fire, had to borrow money from you to get him back on his feet and get seed for his next season to try to get going again, and he hasn't been able to pay you back. Which is very surprising, because this is the guy who will pay you back. All right. <laughs> Seven years. Chase, guy owes you a thousand bucks. It's been seven years. What's your, what do you got to do? Forget it. Yeah. Love you, Dave. Hope when I have a fire, you remember, Dave. <laughs> but, yeah. Chase loaned it to him without charging him interest, and if it wasn't repaid in seven years, why would anybody repay it? Freeland. <laughs> <laughs> Do we want to go there? Do no. we want to talk about an economy where we realize that we are absolutely total debtors and we have to have our debt paid for us or we're toast? We remember that, right? That should ring in our heads a little bit. Okay, okay good. All right. Um, can you get the next one, sir? Yes. Okay. Um, Deuteronomy 15, 12 through 15. If any of your people, even men or women, sell themselves to you and serve you six years, in the seventh year you must let them go free. <coughs> and when you release them, do not send them away empty-handed. Supply them liberally from your flock, your threshing, your threshing floor, and your, your wine press. Give, give to them as the Lord your God has blessed you. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you. That is why I give you this command today. All right. So you've noticed from what Bill read and everybody else has read that the Lord gives a little tag at the end for why you should obey him, right? <clears throat> because, of, because of who I am, he says, because of what I've done for you. All right, so Breland can't pay Chase back. Chase forgives the debt. He keeps drinking, right? <laughs> He's got two more seasons where he, he finally has to sell himself. He's got no nothing left. He's got to sell himself to be a servant. So he's going to be a servant of that going to come work for you. I went fishing with Annette once. Right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. um, so, Annette, here is your servant. He's a Hebrew servant. Now, you, you, this isn't chattel slavery like you think of like in America, but he's a servant in your house. And you're going to pay him and help sustain him, and he's going to work for you. And at the end of seven years, what are you going to do? You're going to let him go. You're not just going to let him go, Annette. What else are you going to do? Hey, Dave, come here. Go pick out a couple sheep over there and get some gallons of olive oil over there. And you know, here's, a little, here's a little walking around, as my father always used to say. Here's a little walking around money. And, and send Dave out free with 
a little bit at least to help them get started it's again. Shoes. Some shoes. Yeah. Get some more pants. Who's got Leviticus 25? <coughs> I think it's 25, 25, and then we'll skip 6 and 7 to 28 because it's very long. But If one of your fellow Israelites becomes poor and sells some of their property, their nearest relative is to come and redeem what they have sold. But if they do not acquire the means to repay, what was sold will remain in the possession of the buyer until the year of Jubilee. It will be returned in the Jubilee, and they can then go back to their property. Perfect. Is this the 70th year? This is the 7th, 7th, or the 50th year. 49th, 50th year. Okay, so we're back to Breland. Um, he he gets so destitute, the only thing he has left is his land, which is the means of his surviving and thriving, and the means of his children and grandchildren after him surviving and thriving. But he can, for a time, go to Maven from the tribe of Issachar and say, have I got a place for you? <laughs> All right? And, Megan, you're going to buy David's land. You're going to give him money to help sustain him. And you can pay him for that land. You know how you're going to calculate it? I think we left it out. But we're going to calculate it by deciding how many crops are left until the year of Jubilee. There's only a few years left before the Jubilee, and the land goes back to David. You're only going to pay him a little for a few crops. But if there's a long time until the next Jubilee, you're going to pay him a higher price. <coughs> because... The land is really the Lord. It's not David, it's not yours. What you're paying David for is the crops that you're going to get. And at the end of the 50th year, no matter what, you give it back to him. He gets a third chance, fourth chance. Is there any hope for this guy? No. <laughs> no. All right. Quickly, we're going to just knock these two out. Uh, this is repeating what you already know. Who's got Exodus 23, 6, and 7? Yes, sir. Uh, do not deny injustice to your poor people in their losses. Have nothing to do with a false charge, and do not put an innocent or honest person to death, for I will not you. So the commandment to treat the poor especially the same in the courts as the, as the wealthy. Do not do injustice to the poor, because they are vulnerable, and you can do injustice to them. Okay, and again, like, I don't want to start a big political conversation, but after living more than a dozen years in an African American community, there is decidedly a difference between poor black people get treated in our courts and somebody like me who can get a lawyer and, and has connections and so forth. Very different. Lastly, Exodus 22, 21 through 22. Anybody? Yes, ma'am. Do not mistreat or oppress the foreigner, for you were foreigners in Egypt. Do not take advantage of the way that was fatherless. Okay. So Dave told me a story earlier today about meeting somebody who said it's we can take in refugees, but only the Christian refugees. Which made him have a connection, right? <laughs> okay. Um, why do you think the Bible repeatedly lists these three groups? Widows, orphans, and aliens or strangers, foreigners. Why, why those three? The most marginalized, the most vulnerable. I wish it weren't the case, but a woman without a protector is in danger. Children without a protector are in danger. And a foreigner who doesn't speak our language, doesn't have citizen rights, doesn't understand the world around us, is in danger. And the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob said, don't do them wrong. Okay, so we're wrapping up, but I want you to think it through. Everybody, this is not socialism, right? Um, there's, built into this, there's the assumption of at least temporary ownership of property. People are given by the Lord land and a way to make a living for themselves and for their families. But the most vulnerable are protected and fed. People who fall in hard times get access to capital without, without interest. If the debts are longstanding, they're forgiven. If they have to go into servitude, they are released after a fixed amount of time and given more blessing to go forward. And last of all, even if it all goes bad, in the 7th-7, they get their land back. Okay, so there's no Donald Trump in that war. Okay? Meaning the rich get rich by charging interest.
and are acquiring things and not having to give them back. And the poor get poor and stay poor because they have to pay interest, because their debt's getting up to here, and they never get a chance back. The only time when the God of the universe gave us a government structure and a societal norm for how to live in a theocracy is the Torah, when he loved and cared for the marginalized. It was built into the society. People could work hard and do better, or struggle and not do better, but nobody ever got so bad they were lost. You did not, could not have multiple generational poverty. If, and no one knows if it ever happened, if Israel actually practiced the law. Okay, we'll stop there. Is there anybody want to say anything about that or a question about that before we stop and pause and break? Okay, it's ten, minutes. Break. 10 minutes. Yeah, I'll really be here in the room. Um, I'm imagining that there may be someone who says, that's fine and good, but um, we live by grace and not by the law, and this is the new time of the New Testament, not the time of the Old Testament, the Torah. This is not a theocracy that we're living in. We are not Jews, and we're, we're not obligated to follow the law. So, um, instead, we're going to go to the New Testament, and we're going to do a whirlwind tour of my favorite gospel, um, written by a physician. Okay. So 24 chapters, and um, I'll tell you that um, many years ago, I decided to go through the Gospel of Luke, and look for references to these issues that we're talking about. And I found um, extensive passages regarding these issues in about 14 of 24 chapters. So I'm going to try to share that with you quickly uh, before I lose the rest of my voice. <coughs> and then we'll move on to, to the question about whether missionaries ruin culture. Okay. So hopefully that's as creepy to you as it was to me the first time I saw it, but <laughs> yeah. Red room. Red room. So that's to remind me that here are the two themes that I believe are persistently through the Gospel of Luke, and they are the priority of caring for the needy is one strange sister, and the other equally present sister is the danger of wealth. So, that's the, the hypothesis that it's smack dab through the entire Gospel of Luke in the New Testament. Let's go. Luke 1. This is the Magnificat, the um, poem that Mary speaks when she's full of the Holy Spirit after she's been told by the angel Gabriel that she's going to bear the Messiah. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is His name. His mercy extends to those who fear Him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. Luke 2. When the time came for the purification rites, this is, um, this is a male child born to an Israelite woman, so she has six weeks after the delivery where she remains unclean, but at the end of that time she brings an offering and completes that. Uh, when the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him, Jesus, to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Except that's really not what it says. It does say that, but the real sacrifice was actually supposed to be a lamb. If she cannot afford a lamb, she's to bring two doves or young pigeons, one for a burnt offering, the other for a sin offering. In this way, the priest will make atonement for her, and she will be clean. So, David set me up for this when he was reviewing last week's renunciation. He asked, what did Jesus renounce as he came? And so I heard he renounced his power, and he renounced his heavenly home, he renounced almost everything. He came as a poor person. Jesus Christ, the King of the universe, when he becomes flesh and dwells among us, comes as a person so poor that his mom and dad have to use this 
discount method for the poor for his very purification ceremony. Luke 3, John the Baptist is a prophet. Prophets are not nice people. Prophets, if you'll excuse the term, are turds in the punch bowl. When you teach the Bible, you guys have done this when you're teaching chronological Bible stories, teaching kids in the neighborhood, teaching my own kids. When we get to the part of the Bible, the prophets, this is a sign for the prophets. Right? Remember the Lord. You stink. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so John the Baptist is the uber prophet. He is the guy. He's the man. He is preaching. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourself, we have Abraham as our father, for I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Very pleasant. Invite that guy to the Christmas party. He's <laughs> full of fun. <laughs> All right? So, what a prophet wants and almost never gets repentance. Right? So evangelists, they want people to believe. Teachers want people to understand. The prophet wants people to go, you're right. It never happens. It never happens. Right. But it happens here. What should we do then? The crowd asked John the Baptist. Does anybody remember what the answer to the question? You got us. We're scared. Just because we're Presbyterians or or American Christians doesn't mean that the axe won't be put to our root. We're not going to take confidence in our denominationalism or our, like, we got to produce fruit. That's what you're saying, Mr. Prophet Man. What should we do? What does he say? Repent. Repent. What else? Be baptized. Be baptized. Good. Not exactly what he says here. Ah, somebody's looking at the Bible. Cheater. <laughs> John answered, anyone who has two shirts or tunics should share with the one who has none, and anyone who has food should do the same. But they didn't work for the food. I worked for the food. I'm just being a prophet right now. <laughs> Luke 4, he went to Nazareth, hometown, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, this is right after he comes out of the wilderness, after he's been tempted by the devil. As he begins his ministry, he goes to the synagogue, and he opens up the scroll of Isaiah, right? Where is it? What's the passage? The inauguration of the Son of God's ministry is what passage? Deuteronomy 8.3. It's not Deuteronomy 8.3. It's a good guess. That was Isaiah. Isaiah 61. 61. Okay. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the year of Jubilee. Opening salvo. In the Gospel of Matthew, we're not in Matthew, I know. The last teaching of Jesus is Matthew 25, before he's arrested. <coughs> it's the sheep and the goats. Last thing he says in Matthew before he's arrested. Sheep, goats, hungry people, naked people, sick prisoner people, you help them come to the reward, prepare for the angels. Didn't help them? Go to the fire, prepare for the devil and his angels. Because I was hungry, you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, you didn't help me. Book ends of the ministry of Jesus. Okay. Luke 6 is the Beatitudes in Luke. So you we know the Matthew Beatitudes better, blessed are the poor in spirit, right? So here's the difference. Matthew um, has in spirit, but Luke is much more concerned about the real life things, not the in spirit. He doesn't say poor in spirit, he says poor. He doesn't say hunger and thirst for righteousness, he says hungry. Okay. Does this mean that one of them got it right, one of them got it wrong? No, Jesus taught for three years. These are different accountings of the teachings of Jesus. The other different thing about Luke is he also has corresponding curses, which is consistent with the Old Testament, right? 
blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience. So, bless you, you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Bless you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Bless you who weep now, for you will laugh. Correspondingly, woe to you who are rich, for you've already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Luke 10. An expert of law stood up to test Jesus' teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Remember the answer? So it's good. That's the rich young ruler, not this passage. Also in Luke. Jumping ahead. It says, what's the law say? Don't murder, don't commit adultery. Love the Lord your God. Is that what it says? You got it open? Yeah. And love your neighbor as yourself, right? Okay. Reinforce. Um, he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and your all your soul and all your strength and with your mind. Um, and love your neighbor as yourself. And then he said, you have answered correctly. Jesus replied, do this. But, wanting to justify himself. Uh, and who is my neighbor? And replied, Jesus said, and then he goes into the... Yeah. Who is my neighbor? So, the answer is, love the Lord your God, love your neighbor. And the guy says, who's my neighbor? And what's the story? Good Samaritan. Maybe the most famous story Jesus ever told. A story about crossing cultures selflessly to, at own, or at own expense, financially, time-wise, otherwise, to care for someone who is physically needy. With no reward for yourself. Don't know what happened to get his get him in the situation where he was. This good Samaritan is behaving as a neighbor according to the definition of Jesus by doing this. <coughs> Luke 11. Woe to you Pharisees because you give God a tenth of your mint, rue, and other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. I have justice in red there because I believe um, very strongly and, and there's if we had time, I would show you, I think I could easily convince you that when Jesus uses justice when he's talking to the Pharisees, he means, he includes the justice laws of the Torah that we talked about before the break. These guys knew the Torah backwards and forwards, and in many cases, memorized it. <clears throat> Luke 12, someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Okay, so this is a family dispute about the will. I don't know, I hope you've never been in that situation before where somebody dies and the will is being disputed. So somebody in the crowd is trying to draw Jesus in to be a judge over this thing. And he says, man, who made me judge between you? Instead, he tells a story. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain, and I'll say to myself, You have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. Call your broker. Pump up those funds. God said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for himself, for themselves, but is not rich toward God. This is a tough answer to a question I heard today about, am I stealing from God if I don't give money to God? Luke 16 is entirely, <coughs> entirely about money. Okay? So, it starts with the weirdest parable of all, that if you've read it, I hope you've been troubled by it. There was a man who was a steward, and his master learned that he wasn't managing the master's property well, and called the steward in and said, give an accounting soon, because you will no longer be able to be the steward. You're losing your job, managing all of my property. And he says to himself, what am I going to do? I'm too weak to dig, and I'm too proud to beg. I know what I'll do. I'll go to everybody who owes my master money, and I'll make that amount less. So he calls in the creditors, people who owe his master. He is the manager of his master's assets. What do you owe my master? 
800 bushels of wheat. Let's make it 400. What do you owe me, Pastor? 400 baths of oil. Let's scratch that out, make it 200. It's cutting huge discount deals to people who, who owe his master money. And according to this parable, I suggest you read it if you want to later, the master complimented the man. Ah, that's, that's pretty good. That's, that's pretty good. There's a parenthetical statement. The people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with each other than the people of the light. But the punchline of the parable is, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that you will be welcomed into heavenly dwellings. And I did not understand it for the longest time. Maybe you, maybe you got it faster than me. It seemed to say a cheating, dishonest person who was manipulating someone else's property for their own good was being approved by God until I understood that he's talking about me. That I have been given stewardship of my family and my education and my influence and the money that I have in my pocket, all of which belongs to the Lord. I am nothing but a steward of the Lord's property. And if I'm smart, I will use what I temporarily have in my control to gain eternal blessing for myself. And I do that by loving and helping others buy it. Jesus is like, huh? <laughs> I have to think about that one. Okay. Jesus tells that story, and then there's a section in the middle where the Pharisees who are listening to him scoff. What's it say in yours? The Pharisees, what do they say? Uh, they sneer. Sneer. Everybody do your best sneer. <laughs> Whips them. What do they say? Uh, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men, but God knows your hearts. What is highly valuable among men is detestable in God's sight. What is highly valuable among men is detestable in God's sight. All right, and then there's the weirdest part of the whole chapter. There's a discourse, brief discourse about divorce. Yes? Um, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery, and the man who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Okay, so what we left out, and I'm sorry, the story, the parable we just told you, the Pharisees, and then Jesus says, I think we left out, he who is faithful with little will be faithful with much, he who is not faithful with little will be unfaithful with much. Okay, so, again, Jason, my interpretation is, here you got your 70 years or 80 years, whatever you got, These are, this is what God's given you, it's temporary, it's worldly, it's nothing compared to eternity, how you play your hand that I've given you for the 70 years is going to determine how it goes on forever. And if you're faithful with little, with unrighteous mammon, is the King James Version of it, you'll get real treasure. Okay, so then there's this weird thing about divorce that seems out of place. In my NIV, it says, like, additional teachings or something. Yeah. Okay, which, that has, you have to assume that the Holy Spirit is therefore a bad editor of the Bible, which I don't believe. Okay, so I wondered forever and ever why that passage was there before this passage. Okay, and we're going to come back to that passage. There was a man, a wealthy man, clothed in purple every day, who dined sumptuously, and at his door was a beggar who longed to fill himself with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table, but never did. Even the dogs came to lick his wounds. The rich man died, and also the beggar. And the rich man, in torment and hell, looked up and saw the beggar at, in Abraham's bosom with the, the patriarch Abraham, and said, Father Abraham, I am in torment here. Send Lazarus, the beggar, to dip his finger in water and put it on my tongue because I'm suffering. And it's insufferable. It's horrible. Abraham says, son, because he calls him Abraham. Like they have a relationship. He's a Jew, right? Abraham calls him son. He's a Jew. Remember who's listening to the story. The Pharisees are sneering. Pharisees are listening to the story. In your life, you had good things, and this guy had terrible things. In any way, there's a chasm between us and you that no one can cross, between heaven and hell, between suffering and paradise. Well, Father Abraham, says the rich man now in hell, please send someone to my five brothers who are still alive to warn them so that they don't end up in this place of torment. And Jesus said, they have Moses and the prophets. 
Let them listen to them. I will say again to you, I believe what Jesus meant then, at least included the things that we talked about before the break. Your brothers in you and you Pharisees who are sneering know that you're supposed to love and care for the poor and not leave a guy without anything except dogs to do his health care on the street. No, Father Abraham, but if someone comes from the dead to warn them, then they'll listen. And Jesus said the most humorous thing, I think, in his entire ministry, in a dark, humorous way. No, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't listen even if someone raises from the dead. All right, why adultery, you ask? Ask me. Why? Why adultery? Here's my... Yes, Chase is not going to go for this, I can tell already. (laughs) The adultery passage is in Deuteronomy 24. If you remember, several of the passages that we read in that section was from that that same part of chapter 23 through 24, which are all of those laws about protecting the needy. I think Jesus was specifically reminding them of that section of the law and that that was what the law and the prophets should be teaching the people of Israel. And that's what would have kept the poor man from being disabused and suffering. Chase is not going for it. I knew he wouldn't. Okay. All right, almost through. We're not going to talk about the rich one ruler, even though I said we would. We're not going to talk about Zacchaeus. What is the proof that Zacchaeus repented and became a son of Abraham, a real son of Abraham? What was the proof? Give away everything. Half of something. Lord, I give away half everything I had, and anybody I cheated, according to the law, I pay him back fourfold. I make economic justice. I obey your law. I tell you today, salvation has come to this house. This man, too, is a son of Abraham. That's what Jesus says about Zacchaeus. The widow gives out of her poverty instead of out of her wealth. Okay, there's the Gospel of Luke. So, have I persuaded you that these twin themes are throughout the Gospel of Luke? The Moroccan missionaries say yes. Yes. Yes, yes, okay. All right, so now I want to tell you another thing I did. I did the same exercise with the Gospel of Luke looking for issues of sexual immorality. I found three. Only three. None of them got the kind of attention that I that you saw some of this. None of, none of them got a whole chapter. So here's my question. Your church, there is a man, a 52-year-old man, who is in attendance all of the time, has um, taught a Sunday school class, and seems to be a good fellow all around, but you find out that twice a year he goes to Thailand for sex vacations. What happens to that guy? Nothing. He gets booted. Nothing happens, or he gets booted. Mm-hmm. What did you say? I said nothing. I do. You could get away with Thailand sex vacations at your church? I couldn't. <clears throat> the, the man in the church did. No. This isn't going to help my illustration. Well, how's it, how's it going to come out, I guess, is what I'm looking at. You what? I don't think that he would have, yeah. Nothing would happen? He'd be gone. No, I, yeah, I think he'd be gone. Okay, how would it go down? It would be a brawl. Okay, well, so before we did house church. Actually, they, he'd probably just disappear quietly. I mean, because it's such a horrendous deal, you wouldn't have to ask him to leave. He'd probably, you know, we got our pastor before we showed up. He was fooling around, and he just disappeared. Everybody, he but threw a big... We also had... There have been other things in our church at the section where we're like, this is a kind of an extreme example. If you just... I, I, I'm deliberately making an extreme example. Okay. So I was hoping that we would go, like, oh, that guy's out. Like, maybe people go to him and plead with him to repent and offer him the opportunity to repent. But if he's not repentant, at my church, at least the old church, he's, he's out of there, right? He's, he's my Cleveland Indian. He's out. <laughs> <laughs> right? Be nice. That was awesome baseball. I, Go right. I think that, Melissa, is that what would happen? 
What's his name? The Lord. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the first time this has come about this class. I'm quite surprised. Well, you've got your name tag right up there. For you to see. I think in most churches, you wouldn't have to. You wouldn't be asked to leave. You wouldn't come back. All right. But David's saying that it's shameful enough you would leave, right? Okay. You want to make your case? Well, I just don't think, well, number one, how is that going to come out? Who's going to even find out or know? His wife finds out, brings it to the others. Oh, Let's say okay. That. Well, then it'd be obvious. I think a lot happens that we just don't know about. Okay. But that would fall I'm in that category. Hoping that we will all generally agree that NIH gets made a bigger deal of than talking to NIH. <laughs> 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 all right. It's just like the whole homosexuality thing and like all that other stuff. All right. It gets elevated in okay. the real problem. So. That's all right. It's good. He's tracking. I, this guy's got his Bible open the whole time. A plus. Okay. Um, all right. So in a hopefully generally healthy functioning church, there, this would get attention. This would get um, dealt with. Dealt with. Okay. And I have been in churches in my years where a persistently unrepentant sexual sinner is is disfellowship. Is okay. So. The question is, what happens if you've got a 52-year-old doctor who works hard as he can and makes as much money as he possibly can and gives little or nothing to the poor? Make what him an elder. Yeah. <laughs> He's heard this talk a time or two. Yeah. It's true. Okay? So in my Memphis world of churches, like, we say we love the Bible and we understand the, like, the principle of proportion, things that are repeated over and over again and expanded are, are more important. It's like the teacher in college going, this is on the test. <laughs> we talked about this five times. Put it in the notes. On the test. I don't mean we should have sexual immorality at all, but the same way that God's love for the nations begins in Genesis and goes to Revelation. God's love for the poor and for justice is the same. It is in the Torah. It is smack through the teachings of Jesus and the Gospels. It's in the prophets of the Old Testament. So that's why we need both. We need to be afraid of money. There are warnings against the dangers of wealth in the epistles in the New Testament. We need to be depleting it on behalf of the poor and the vulnerable. It is, a, it is historically a, the cardinal sign of Christianity. The last non-Christian emperor, it goes by the term um, apostate, Julian the Apostate. So he was, he was a reactionary who tried to call the Roman <coughs> Empire back to the Roman pantheon of gods and away from Christianity in the fourth century. He said, the godless Galileans care not only for their own poor, but for ours also. They spend more money on the needy than we do in our temples. That was the mark of the early church. How do you define justice? Anybody want to take that one? No. Okay. I mean, I would normally <laughs> define justice getting what you deserve. And injustice. I'm not surprised to hear you say that. <laughs> <laughs> injustice would be not getting what you deserve. Okay, so this is important. Even again, it's really just David and I in the room right now. <laughs> so it's a multi-meaning word. So there is this notion in the gospel. It's dearest to us all. The punishment that Rick Down deserved fell on Jesus. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for me, so that I might become the righteousness of God. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each has turned to his own way, and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Thank you, Jesus, for just for taking my just punishment. Okay? But it is a multi-meaning word in the Bible, and I've been trying for the last hour to teach what I believe is another biblical meaning of justice, which is fairness, which is equity, which looks around and sees, like, if those group of people are suffering and those people aren't, that's not right. That's not just. And it's not just because they're lazy or stupid. It's because there are things happening in the world here based on power and greed. They're antithetical to the justice that God put forth in the Torah and in the New Testament teachings of Jesus. Justice is you caring 
that people don't hear and do the gospel in their parts of the world. And it's you caring that they suffer, that they have these human development scores in the, in the ditch. It's not just getting what we deserve. If we got what we deserve, we would be in hell. We are most like our Father in Heaven when we, at our own expense, pour out what we have on, for the others. Even though Jesus says, be like your Heavenly Father, for He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. So when I'm doing my doctor thing, and I'm caring for somebody, and I think in my heart, because I'm a dark person, like, they ought to be grateful. They know I could be doing something else and making more money, and they're not grateful. Maybe they even call me a name. A bad name. Like, I'm wrong. God gave me doctrine to make his name look great and to advance his kingdom, and if I want to really be like Jesus, I'm going to be rejected and suspected and betrayed and hated and spit upon and suffer and maybe even die. Yes! I get to be like Jesus. Step on me. I, I, I stood here for two seconds, right? I'll, I'll pray at night, Lord, let me be a servant of patience. Then at 3 a.m., some knucklehead will call one to refill on a medicine that they should have gotten two weeks ago, and I'll stop being a servant all of a sudden. <laughs> Because I've been treated like a servant, I get mad. But the world has been won. The gospel has been expanded among the poor and needy because we do both. And because we care about not just the justice of getting what you deserve, but the justice of everyone having an opportunity. Everybody got land. Everybody had access to capital. Everybody got their debts forgiven. Okay, it's a great question. We got 10, 15 minutes left. All right. So in 2007, these Koreans went to Afghanistan. They were they were kidnapped. I don't know if you remember the story. It's getting a little bit older now. Two of them, the men were killed. What were Koreans doing in Afghanistan? I ask you. How is it these people decided to become Korean missionaries? How is it that Korea was one to Jesus? Does anybody know the story? I'm going to tell you. Okay. So, Korean royal family, 1884, Presbyterian from Georgia, yep, Dr. Horace Allen was one of the first foreign missionaries sent by the Presbyterian Church before we had South and North and all that stuff, actually it would have been afterwards, right? And he goes to what we now know as Korea, and he tries his best to integrate himself into the culture and to share the gospel, and he gets nowhere, until a nephew of the king has an assassination attack on him and he gets a wound that gets infected. And none of the medicine available to the Koreans at the time work. And the kid is about to die when they call in this Western doctor and he figures out how to cure the guy and he survives in a way that the Koreans have never seen before. And the king opened wide open the country. He was allowed in 1885 to open the first hospital and run it with Christian people. Shortly thereafter, 1887, two years after the first hospital, they began founding schools, 800 different schools of various grades, educating and teaching the poor to read, which had never been done before in Korea. Reading was only for the elites. This guy, John Ross, concentrated <coughs> on understanding the Korean language and translated the whole Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, into Korean relatively soon after the missionary effort began. So it was like the Wycliffe of Korea. And in 1912, really only about 30 or 40 years after the initial missionary effort, if you can imagine, like an entire pagan nation, 40 years later, hundreds of schools, thousands of converts, the Presbyterians are gathering, they already have Korean leadership who took over the next decade and have been growing like more Presbyterians in Korea. What? Yeah. Okay. Then they are in this room, for sure. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. And like you, some of you, I've been in some pretty dark corners of the world. There's always a Korean. All right? They're running a restaurant. You're in the little hotel in the middle of nowhere. And at four in the morning, you hear the match strike. And you hear, blessed be the Lord. They're singing. They're praying. They're awesome. They ran into Afghanistan and got some of them got killed. 
Lawrence is one of the fathers mourning the loss of his kids. Who knows this movie? Ah. Uh, okay. Yes. <laughs> all right. The gray hairs are all like that. <laughs> all right. So we used to have this thing called movies. Now I'm just kidding. Right. So Humphrey Bogart, you, maybe you've heard of Humphrey Bogart. So he was the best looking ugly man in the world. This is a movie from 1951, Captain Hepburn. Remember Captain Hepburn? No. Love and you're my knight in shining armor. Right. So the backstory for this movie is that Catherine Hepburn and her brother are missionaries in the German Congo. No, in the yes. In the Congo. In the Congo, and they make fun of the missionaries. Okay, there's early scenes. It's really a romance. The brother is killed by the Germans. It's World War, it's World War One era, and it's a love love story. And there's leeches on them and stuff. It's kind of interesting. But, but there's a scene early on where the missionary couple, the, the, the brother and sister, are trying to teach Methodist hymns on the piano to the Africans, who are just kind of... <laughs> okay. And the, the message is, this is bad. You know, this, these people are doing something stupid and bad. Have you heard of the book, The Poisonwood Bible? Yes. Okay. So, same, same basic notion. It's a story of uh, Southern Baptist missionaries go also to the Congo, I think, and um, don't really learn the language and don't don't accommodate the culture and respect it and and in a very unfavorable light are, are viewed as culturally imperialistic, forcing American Christian culture on people in another culture, disrespectfully and, and unkindly. And this goes, this is not a new notion. I mentioned I've been to Urbana twice, the first time I was a medical student. It was still on the campus of the University of Illinois at Urbana, and we came into a classroom for a lecture for one of the seminars, and on the blackboards, people had written, missionary services imperialism. Stop exporting American culture. Stop cultural homicide. The notion that Christian people, Christian missionaries going into a culture do harm to the culture. Are you familiar with the charge? Okay. All right. I want to tell you about the best dinner party I ever went to. And it was in the Gore province of Afghanistan. Okay. So we were, Afghanistan, I told you, I think, um, was the first country that we began to send medical missionaries to in 2003. And the IMOC people, which are one of the priority 15 people, live in the, this, this part of Afghanistan. So Kabul is over here, and Iran is over here, so it's kind of in the middle of the country. Except where the river is, um, it's deserty and dry, and, and it's difficult. It gets very cold in the wintertime. So um, it happens that near Shakshiran, which is this, the town that we, our missionaries were living, there is one of these things that you would see on National Geographic, like these unprotected and unknown, amazing cultural artifacts. So this is the Minaret of Jean, and, and it really is pretty amazing. It's been there for like 850 years, something like that. So people go out to see it sometimes. The Minaret of John is, is an important thing. So this is our team. When we met with the governor of the Gore province, he gave us a rug. And can you see the Minaret of John? And yeah, it's, it's a cultural thing. So we went there on this trip to um, our, our gig was to teach Afghan doctors. So bring in some American medical doctors, invite the Afghan doctors who are Muslims, Gain some favor for your ministry that's in the area by providing a service to the Afghan doctors. So we gave lectures about leishmaniasis and things like that. And that night, this is these are some of the Afghan doctors, and you can see we, we brought several of us, so we sat in with the, some of my partner, one of my partners. Okay. And, and the last night we had we had a big dinner. We we had Afghan style dinner, so it's all on the floor, right, with toe shacks around, but tons of palau, delicious rice and raisins and more oil than you've ever been in Texas, and, and um, lamb, many dead lambs, uh, giving themselves for this dinner. And, um, okay, and so I wish I had a better picture, but this is the guy I want to tell you about. The, the reason this was the best dinner party ever, it was great to meet the Afghan doctors, and this guy here actually uh, whispered in the ear of my friend 
that he was already a disciple of Jesus. He had already become a disciple. But the reason it was the greatest dinner party is because there was a group who had flown in to see the Minaret of Jean, three Americans, and it was a father and two sons. The father was a man named Dudley Woodbury. Mm-hmm. The guy in this picture. Yeah. So he's the missions emeritus professor at Fuller Seminary, and his main thing is Muslim. He's written extensively about Muslims who've converted from Islam to Christianity. And so I really wanted to hear from him. I wanted to muscle my way in to sit next to him and talk to him, but I couldn't. I got, I got boxed out by other people. And so I was sort of listening in. And I remember this one thing. Somebody asked him, like, what's the, what's the thing more than anything else that's led to Muslims converting to Christianity? He's asked, he'd asked hundreds of Muslim background Christians, what led them to convert? What do you think the biggest deal was? This is an aside to the point. Caring for the needy? Caring for the needy? No, I'd be good though. I'd be really good. <laughs> Kindness? Yes, basically. Yeah, I thought it would be like visions and dreams, and that does happen a lot. But they said, no, it's, we see the Christians loved each other. Like the men loved the wives, and the wives loved them. And they were kind to each other, and it was, they lived a life of love was the most persuasive thing. It was great. Okay, but I didn't get to be part of that conversation. I had to sit next to the son, one of the sons. And this is the son in his native environment. Okay, This is Robert Woodbury, and he's a professor of sociology. And I started to talk to him because I didn't get to talk to his dad, and I was a little bitter. And I started to ask him what his research was. And his study, for which he's now relatively famous, is studying the impact of Protestant missionaries on cultures where they go. Because the basic assumption is, like in the African Queen or the Poisonwood Bible, um, that when Christian missionaries go to a culture, they do harm to it. That they miss, they cause to, uh, hardship and they, they, they do harm to the cultures through imperialism. Okay, so here's what Woodbury has said and um, this is the best place to read about it if you want to. This is Christianity Today. This is an online version of it from January of 2014. But the surprising discovery about those colonialist proselytizing missionaries. And here's the bottom line since we've got five minutes left. Wherever Protestant missionaries went who were not funded by the governments of their home countries, so Catholic missionaries typically for Spain or Portugal were very tightly connected with the government. If you've ever seen the movie The Mission, you see some of that in that movie. So we're talking about Protestant missionaries who went to countries without being closely attached to their governments. Wherever they went, good things happened. This is a summation. Areas where Protestant missionaries had a significant presence in the past are on average more economically developed today with comparatively better health, lower infant mortality, lower corruption, greater literacy, higher educational attainment, especially for women, and more robust membership in non-governmental associations. He's written a book called The Missionary Roots of Liberal Democracy. By liberal, he doesn't mean, he, he means freedom democracy, like democracy. Not that that's the greatest thing in the world to export, but he, he went to West Africa, he went to Togo, and he went into places and, and libraries and found relatively few books in Togo, which is a Francophile country. He went next door to Ghana, where there were walls and walls and walls of libraries and books, and he traced it backward, and he realized that missionaries were not allowed in Togo, the missionaries in Ghana made printing presses and opened schools and taught women and children how to read, and that those books in Ghana were not just Western books, they were Ghanaian books, books that came from the people themselves, and that the Christian missionaries spurred on academic learning, progressive political thoughts, rights for women, protection of the poor, ends of slavery. Christian missionaries cared about justice. And if the national 
powers that they were, if they were British citizens, for instance, in a country that was being colonial, that was uh, was a colonial country of the British, and bad things were happening, they would go back to Britain and they would speak about it. They would cause a stink about the bad behavior of the of the nation and alter the behavior of the country. Here's a couple other things I want to tell you. Um, one is that he, because this was such a countercultural thing, again, you ought to think about uh, looking up Christianity. You can read it online if you want to. Because it was antithetical to what the academy, the academic world thought, he had to be super, super careful about demonstrating with all manner of statistical reliability the truth of his claim, and he, he did it. And then he subsequently has been reinforced by people who have gone behind him and reproduced in other ways the same truth. That were Christian missionaries who pushed for conversions, Protestant missionaries, unattached to their countries, wherever they went, the country did better, much better. That more than any other factor, that led to positive development in, the, in these countries. That that's, that's our answer to the charge that we destroy culture. Less cultures because of what, the kingdom of Jesus. Even in countries, this was the thing I've been struggling to understand since I, I reread this on the plane. Even in countries where there seemingly weren't large numbers of converts, there were still progressive changes that happened in the culture. Five more minutes? Yes. All right. We'll finish up with, I have one more thing I want to show you. That I think that should bring home the lesson 12 lessons. Okay, so this is a book called, obviously called Preaching Heal. It's written by a friend, a guy who's been a teacher here that David, because David's got powers beyond all of his perspective, <laughs> teacher, uh, coordinator powers. Preaching Heal. This guy is, his real name's Chuck Cheatham. His, his pen name, because he lives in the Muslim world, is Charles Fielding. But his argument is we have to do both. We have to preach and heal. This is for medical people. Okay, so, but hang in there with me, even though it's medical if you're not medical. All right, and he teaches, and we have been using, and I'm going to show you how we've done it, something that he calls the ABCs. It goes through, through E. So A is use your what, what you got. You're an English teacher. You're a doctor. You're a physical therapist. You're a dentist, whatever. Use what you've got to access the community, that's A. So, we picked Afghanistan, and then we looked and saw what is it that we could do medically to try to access the community. B, get behind closed doors. So particularly in the parts of the world where, where we are at least, you don't stand on the street corner and call people to repentance, because you could get shot for doing that. And people are unwilling in many cases to have spiritual conversations if they're afraid others will hear it, their guard down. So try to get B behind closed doors. C, care for the needy. Find the places where you can help the needy, which is, again, is Lesson 12's main message. D, disciple, make disciples. And E, empower the church. And if he had an F, it would be find another place to go afterwards. Like, try to get this done almost in the amazing way the Korean story that I told you happened in less than <coughs> half a century. Okay, so this is Shak Sharan. I told you about it. This is us accessing it many years ago. That's an old Soviet plane that got shot down in the background that they keep around just for good looks, I guess. Um, family practice doctor, nurse practitioner. Um, that guy kept us alive. He's a fireman and a contractor, and he can plumb and do electricity and keep us alive. Keep us alive. This is the IMOC people. They're one of the priority 15 people. They are a Persian-Iran um, influenced Afghan group of people who speak Dari primarily. <clears throat> there are historically less, way, way less than 2% Christians among the, the IMOC people. Okay, so here's the strategy that we used. 
we determined that Afghanistan was a World Health Organization high burden tuberculosis country, meaning lots of people get TB and die, and tuberculosis worldwide is most prevalent among the poor, especially women and children. So Afghanistan had a big burden of TB. We went to the World Health Organization and got free medicines. We went to the World Food Program and got food supplements. And then we went to the Afghan government and said, we want to go to the Gore province, where the Ayamak people are, and test for and treat TB patients in the same way it happens in the United States, in the same way it should happen everywhere. TB is supposed to get something called DOTS, Directly Observed Therapy. You're supposed to watch people swallow their medicine because you have to take multiple medicines for weeks. And if you only take for a short time, you can develop multi-drug resistant tuberculosis that's more likely to kill you. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So if you get TB in Wilmington, North Carolina, or Shakshaw in Afghanistan, somebody from the health department or somewhere is going to come watch you take your pills every day for eight weeks. Multiple pills. Okay, so these were the Afghan guys that we, we trained to be DOTS workers to identify those people and go make sure they took their medicine every day. Did they look scary to you? They looked scary to me the first time. I was like, oh man, I think, I think that guy right there wants to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> Great guys, honestly. Light microscope, which is relatively um, inexpensive, is all you need to. S you take that's a little disgusting, but you take sputum from a patient who you suspect, and you make a smear with a few stains, and then you look on a microscope, and you look for what are called red snappers. That's what the organism looks like when you see it under the stain. Low tech. You can even do it with light mic microscope without power if you don't have it. So we, we bought a few of those, and then we convinced the Department of Health, the Afghan Division of Health, to build on the back of their already existing little primary health care centers, an extra room to do the testing and the staining. Um, this woman in particular, who is from this part of the country, she's from South Carolina actually, Lisa grew up as a missionary kid in Latin America, fluent Spanish, and she learned Dari almost immediately. She was able to go out with the DOTS workers, live in the villages with women, and preach the gospel many times, show the Jesus film in Dari many, many times to many people as part of this, this outreach behind closed doors. Okay. And eventually, one of these guys became a disciple. What you see behind are the maps of the regions, and everywhere you see a pin is where there's a village where people were getting the treatment. These are the guys getting the training. Which guy is the least likely to come This guy look pretty scary? Yeah. That's the Christian. <laughs> yeah. All right, so that's the end of my five minutes. I'm not going to tell you about Somalia. Um, over the, it, it eventually got politically unstable and a part of this, and we had to pull back. But we ran this for four or five years. We treated and cured probably seven or 8,000 people, again, mostly women and children. That, in TB, um, means that you prevented an additional probably five to 10,000 other cases that would have happened if those people hadn't been cured. So we were involved in curing in a meaningful way with the best of technology, 15 or 20,000 of the poorest people of, the, of Eastern Afghanistan, Western Afghanistan. If nobody converted and believed in Jesus and became a disciple. If no church came out of it, churches have come out of it and people have converted. But if none of that had happened, if there had been no spiritual fruit, would that have glorified Jesus? Freeland? <laughs> Freeland says no! <laughs> Lots of preaching, right? Jesus God's failed. responsible. That's right. Okay. We just do what we're told. That's right. But we didn't do it half, you know what? did it really for the glory of God because I believe Jesus in his kingdom and everything that is concerned about the poor, the Lord's concerned about the marginalized, but that honors God even if there are no converts, but there were and together it's unbeatable Sir, um, What if you did all that without ever 
for sharing the gospel? Do you think, like, at all? Like, nothing? Do you think that's still glorifying to God? What do you think I'm going to say? I don't know. Yes. Well, you're, you're fulfilling the... Does Red Cross glorify God? Um, I don't know if Red Cross glorifies God. <laughs> Alright, so I'm not at all offended at the question. It's a perfectly good question, but we would never do that. Like, Jesus is Lord. <clears throat> he loves the nations. He's got a, a, a group of, of IMOC who will believe the gospel, who will be before the throne of Jesus with every other people, tribe, tongue, and nation ever. Like, it's going to happen. So, we... We were, we were truly trying to preach and heal. And that's, that's the point of Lesson 12 is don't do one or the other. But usually people are conservative evangelicals of my tribe are less respectful of the meaningful loving and caring for the poor, the doing, than they are of the preaching. And so I try to poke people on that when I'm in this crowd. If I'm among a bunch of people who are believers in the social gospel, who don't believe in the divinity of Jesus and the truth of the, the cross and the eternal life and heaven and hell, and I poke them a different way. But it's, it's not one or the other, right? It's got to be both. There are times where you can't share the gospel, but we're trying to get behind closed doors. We're like deliberately trying to think through strategies where we can. Our goal is to make disciples, plant churches. Yes? careful. You have to pray and wait for people to ask questions. You have to you do other things like say, oh, tell me why you have this sacrifice every year of this goat and let me tell you the story from the Bible that's this. And, and you know that some of those people are deliberately sent there to watch you. Yeah. That guy they thought was a spy. They even worried about him when he expressed a desire for a Bible. Is he just testing us to see if we'll give him a Bible? What would you, I mean, this, this group here, going back to the, maybe the social thing, what, I guess what would your, you know, you go to the medical schools, you're looking for students. Yes. What would, be, what, what could we do? How should we change? Just get in the soup kitchen another day of the week? like it's more than that. <clears throat> okay, so I, I think the answer to this question, which is a question we should all be asking every day, right, is the, the first place, which I believe this man does, I don't, I don't know him super well, but I've known him for years. Like, I know right now he really wants to be a missionary somewhere. He's been taking steps to see, how can I take my GE nuclear engineer self to China or one of these cities, like, so, like, but he's frustrated, and he, you, the question, you can hear the question, like, why don't I get to be a doctor in Afghanistan? <laughs> okay, but, like, it's all about surrender, isn't it? It's all about whatever you want, wherever you want it, like, please rule over my mind and my heart and my soul and my strength for your glory. Please, 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 and let me be part of your kingdom coming and your will being done on earth the way it is in heaven. Like that's Put yourself in the position of a parent. If a kid comes to you, your child comes to you and asks to please let me be obedient to you, mom or dad. Like That's a prayer you're going to answer. That's a request you're going to answer. So, like There's got to be a reason Breland's not in China now. But if he's, if he gets over this like disdain for poor people. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's it, Dave. <laughs> it's, like, I don't know the answer. And, like, everything I've told you has just been stumbling obedience mixed with disobedience for 25 years. Like, it's a joke that I'm, I'm not an expert. I'm just here telling you what we've done. Um, but I, like, if you're surrendering and asking the Lord to do with you what he wants, really surrendering, he, he will 
will do with you what he wants. It's the negotiating that you heard Dave talk about earlier that's the problem. Like, I'll do, I'll go, but I gotta have a husband first. Or, I'll go, but I won't go there. I've got a temperature max that the Lord and I discussed. Like, <laughs> our Chad people don't. 120 degrees. I don't know how they do it. Desert dry heat. It's not <laughs> <laughs> I believe you're right. They say, like, if you can't sleep because you're so hot, like, that's where it starts to really get to you. So, like, a swamp cooler, a little fan, get it down to 90. <laughs> I think he who's faithful with little will be faithful with much. So, I mean, that's the message for the youngest people in this room. Like, don't. The three messages I gave it are bad. Like, don't wait, don't compromise, don't go alone. That's pretty good advice, actually. Jason, just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Other comments, questions? I'll, I'll break. Dear Heavenly Father, I just uh, thank you for this evening. Uh, thank you for Rick's teaching. Um, thank you for um, uh, working with us as we are. Um, <clears throat> call us to be part of your plan. We, you know that we know that's difficult. You know that's difficult for us. Just ask you to continue to work, uh, break down barriers, and reach into our heart. Put uh, the burden on us. Uh, keep us in contact with other people. Help us encourage each other. There's so much that uh, opportunities, things we can do, things to learn. Just so thankful for this evening. You know, he said, uh, you know, there wasn't all the homework. 
Oh. But which one was missing? Which, which, which is 10? Yes. Did I, get, did I hand you something? You didn't get anything? I'll check. I got a couple last week. I'll make sure it wasn't. Because I handed out some less than 10s. Yeah. So this is, these, oh, are, oh, these, are, these are going in. Maybe you gave it to Matt. Uh, <laughs> I'll check. I mean, I don't know. Okay. We didn't actually pause for him, so I just yeah. tell him I'm a father. We did when he started. Yeah, I thought you were going to get this time. We're the other. I don't know. 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 Okay. See you later. Just so. Sorry. <laughs> I'm out. Oh, yeah. That's all right. Um, so if you want to grab our newsletter, we can send you a digital copy. And Here's another homework uh, to go through. We should probably share it. I'll just do it. Okay. Thank you, guys. They're incredible. We've never heard them before. And this is specifically like our center. Um, yeah, we've never heard them before. And then, 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 yeah, we've never heard them before. So most of the places will be like that. Probably not going to UNCW because that one will probably expire. I mean, we can connect on Facebook, too. So and it was just kind of one of those things that Jeff went, and I went and did the work and came back and said, yeah, we're doing so much. Starting more coffee time? So next, next time I see you, I'll be like, hey, what's up? <laughs> 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 no, because I, like, literally, like, I looked up at you, and I was like, I, I know you get a perspective, but I was like, uh, I was like, I grew up as a Muslim missionary. Yes, I am, so I just did it. like it's like east side, west side, you know, you guys are there, we're here. You just got to bring that pride. So what are you carrying? Solid foundation. So you guys all go to the church, right? Yeah. Yeah, here are good things about the church. Yeah, I love it. Where do you guys, where do you guys meet, actually? Kind of hearing more stories. We meet on Market Street. Okay. Every time. It's near the Port St. John's. I'm great. We're like, we're so beautiful. Like, oh, like downtown? Okay, okay, gotcha. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Did you guys, like, take over the, the like, where the roastery used to be? Is that where, is it? Is that, like, the Fresh Market? Yeah, I think so. Is it, like, so is it right behind the Port St. John's? Okay. It's right beside Milk Creek. Okay, yeah. nice. That's awesome. Um, where do you guys go? Of course, uh, yeah, we're yeah. Yeah. We, so, Traherne was one that actually went, and I would say that I... And then I just do, um, we do, like, our small groups. Probably, like, really where we, we kind of don't know a lot. We're starting to do, uh, so like, just Bible studies. Um, like, not just book-based, but, like, word-based, and that's been really good. Because for a lot of, like, for the first, like, two weeks, we kind of went through books, which were good, like, we went through books, but some of the people were so that was my lining of like, yeah. I just don't know, you know, no, going like, um, into Spain as much as you did, as far as you know, like, I would say for a woman, but like, for, working well with like, do you like, 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 like,